Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the club for acts and actors for this reading of Gil Martin by Tom O'Brien, who I'm delighted to see is with us in the audience. And in the, yes, let's do that. <laughs> he has um, asked me to say, and he would, wouldn't he? And I think it's a very good idea to say that he brought some copies of this play, the published script with him today, so if anybody feels inspired to buy one um, after the reading, I'm sure he'd be very happy to inscribe it. The reading is approximately 90 minutes in length with no interval. We're going to motor straight through, and then afterwards, it's about half past four, quarter to five, something like that. I hope you all come up and avail yourselves of the wonderful bar upstairs, which is very inexpensive. The readers today are as printed on the little programs you would have found on seats. Um, I think that's everything. Oh yes, could you please make sure your mobile phones are switched off? Thank you. Almost forgotten to say that in these, uh, these difficult times. Lovely that they've come to an end. So thank you for joining us and now we will start. Martin by Tom O'Brien. Prologue. Lights come up slowly to reveal Tom Gilmartin pacing the room. The backdrop shows a larger than life image of Paul Robeson. We Irish are often referred to as the blacks of Europe, and maybe we are. We too have suffered famine, persecution, our rights and freedoms taken away. No blacks, no dogs, no Irish. We all remember that, don't we? But what about our own people? Those at the top, I mean, politicians and the like. When they behave worse than the Mafia or the Ku Klux Klan, how do we deal with that? Act one, scene one. Tom Gilmartin, a man in his late 50s, emerges from a meeting with Charles Hockey and a number of his government ministers. Tom sits in a chair for a moment, thinking. After a while, a woman enters. I think the boss was impressed. The boss? Charlie. Sure, that's what we all call him. We? Excuse me, have we met? Do I know you? Wasn't I at the meeting? Were you? <clears throat> Where were you? In a cupboard? Oh. Then is the country's most powerful man. They'll get you whatever you want. And what do I want? Money. Isn't that what we all want? I thought all I wanted was to get this bloody development at Quarryvale off the ground. Oh, we're all behind you on that. It's the money that's the problem. No, the money's not a problem. When I get the go-ahead, I'll get the money. In fact, it's already there, just waiting for the okay. Ah, now, I think there's a little misunderstanding here. I was thinking more about no, the expenses. God, is this another shakedown? Don't you realise you're going to get every assistance to get your two projects off the ground? We don't do this sort of thing for every Tom, Dick and Harry. This sort of thing? What do you think was going on in there? A bloody garden party? That was a show of unity. To show we are all behind you. The bus doesn't do appearances like this every day of the week. It is a major investment that I'm bringing to the country. You also, we're all aware that you're going to make hundreds of millions out of these projects. Not me. Whoever insists on it might, but it won't be me that makes hundreds of millions. Well, we think that you should give us some of the money up front. We? Everybody has agreed. And we would like you to deposit five millions pounds, that is before you start. Can you say that again? I think I'm hearing things. We want you to deposit five million pounds. And we want it deposited in an Isle of Man account. Does the boss know about this? The woman takes a strip of paper and hands it to Tom. Tom looks at it. 
What's this? It's the account details. You seriously want me to put five million in there? Yes. You make the bloody mafia look like monks. What do you think I am? Do I look like I came up the Liffey on a banana boat or something? The woman tries to grab the paper from Tom's hand, but he fends her off and sticks it in his pocket. You could wind up in the Liffey for saying things like that. Well, you know what you can do? You can F off whoever you are. You won't get very far with an attitude like that. Remember, we'll be in touch. Scene two, Tom speaks to the audience. He is calling out amounts and handing out fat brown envelopes. Each envelope is collected by a hand reaching out from behind a curtain. Patrick Flynn, 50,000. Ray Burke, 40,000. Liam Lawler, 81,000. Bertie Ahern, 50,000. George Redmond, 100,000. Ah, oh, Christ, the list is endless. Liam Lawler appears. The first time I met Liam Lawler was in the Dead Man's Inn, a pub in Palmerstown. I was interested in finding out the ownership of the land in Quarry Vale, and I had been told that Lawler was my man. He knew where every blade of grass was growing in Dublin, I was assured. He came tearing in the door, all hail fellow well met, and he wasn't the slightest bit interested in what I had to know. All he only wanted to talk about was the bachelor's walk development, which he said was on his patch, and told me the government had allocated to take care of me and to get the deal into Dublin. He'd take care of me. He did that all right. Next thing I know, he turns up at the meeting in London, brazen as brass, saying he'd been appointed by the government to look after bachelor's walk, and they would have to have him on board if the scheme was to get off the ground. He went on to say that he could knock two years at least off the time to develop the scheme if he was on board. The fucker had so neck. <laughs> I said to him, I hadn't invited him, which I hadn't, that I didn't even know him and that I only met him on one occasion. He contradicted me and said I had invited him. That's the sort of bastard he was, twisting people's words to suit his lies. He was a hustler, no doubt about it. Years later, when the details of his dodgy dealing finally came out at the Mahon Tribunal, he was prepared to go to prison rather than reveal any of his financial shenanigans. Anyway, I left him talking with my backers and we went off for a cup of tea. About an hour later, he turned up, big grin on his face. Well, they've appointed me. What do you mean? Your backers. I'm on board, in the mix. I told them I wanted 20% stake. Jesus, you so neck. I'll say that for you. And a hundred thousand up front. But they turned me down. But they have some bit of sense anyway. But they agreed that you would give me half of your stake and the hundred grand up front. Then, then, will you go back and tell them you'll get nothing of my stake and no hundred thousand? Well, we won't fall out over the matter yet. They have agreed to pay me a consultancy fee of three thousand five hundred a month. Consultancy? You need somebody to help you traverse the difficult political landscape in Dublin. And you're that man, I suppose. Someone to ease you through the corridors of power. Sure, I know every... I know every blade of grass. I don't need you or anybody. I think I can still recognise grass. You'll have to work with me or you're going nowhere. See you in Dublin. He had convinced my backers that he could win the necessary political support for the Bachelor's Walk project. And they had agreed to the consultancy fee. I was to pay it and be reimbursed by the company. He didn't like it, but there wasn't much I could do. The first check was given to Lawler with the pay section left blank at his insistence. Jesus, I tell you, he was something else. On other occasions, the checks were made out to his brother-in-law who had no idea what was going on. The next time I saw him was in Dublin Airport a few weeks later. What are you doing here? You could say that I'm your chauffeur. I don't want you to be my anything. Ah, uh, sure, it's no trouble. I was passing this way anyway, and you'll need someone to show you around. How did you know I was going to be here on this particular flight? Uh, that would be telling. Uh, where are you taking me? We're going to see George Redmond, Assistant County Manager. He's the man you want to see for anything to do with planning in Dublin. Hop in 
and I'll have you there in two shakes of a lamb's tail. Enter George Redmond. George, this is Tom Gilmartin. He wants to pick your brains. Oh, slim pickings there, I'm afraid, so. <laughs> ah, Jesus, will you go away with that? They're the best brains in the council this man has. If it's planned you want to know, George knows where all the bodies are buried. Metaphorically speaking, I think. Mean. What he doesn't know about rezoning isn't worth knowing. Not to mention where the roads, water, and sewage services would be available. Isn't that right, George? Oh, if you say so, Liam. Now, how can I help you, Tom? Well, uh, I'm looking to buy some land along the Dublin Galway Road. Aren't we all? Uh, council land, is it? I'm not sure. It might be. Oh, I thought your interest was in the bachelor's walk development. I see news travels fast in this town. Well, that too. But another area I am looking at, and I want to know who owns the plots of land out by Quarryvale. He doesn't see the looks exchanged by the other two men. Another site for development, is it? Quarryvale. But that's an easy one. It's uh, owned by the council. He goes behind his desk and emerges in a moment with a colour-coded map providing the information. There you are. I think you'll find what you need. Thanks. As he studies the map, the other two men talk jokingly about the value of the information provided. Did you hear that, George? Thanks. That's worth a lot more than thanks. Do you think so, Liam? Indubitably, George. Indubitably. That's a darling word, Liam. What's it worth? A hundred thousand? Indubitably. Oh, I don't see why not. Corrie Vale, are you planning to develop it? Well, now, that remains to be seen, as the monkey said when he pissed behind the grand piano. Well, you're going to have to pay me 100,000 if you want this to proceed, and George will want 100,000 as well. Please. I will not give you a penny of my money. That's not the way it works in this town. I always thought if you applied for planning permission, and if it looked good, then you got it. Someone's got to pay the piper, Tom. I don't like the tune, Liam. Redmond returns his phone conversation at an end. Liam tells me you require 100,000 for this to proceed. Oh, for what to proceed? Nothing's been requested from me apart from some information. That cost nothing. I, I hope I've been of some help to you, Mr. Gilmartin. Uh, you may keep the map. Uh, now, if you'll excuse me. Tom speaks directly to the audience. I never trusted Redmond from the first time I met him. I thought he was a sneak. By our third meeting, he had confirmed my impression that he was a gangster. I also realized that I had learned at first hand the cost of doing business in Dublin. I tried not to let either Lawler or Redmond in on my plans for Quarry Vale, but it was difficult to keep it secret. My backers, Arlington, eventually got fed up with the endless delays. And after a year of bickering and demands for money, they pulled out of Dublin and the Bachelor's Walk project, leaving me free to concentrate on Quarryvale, which, in any case, was a much better proposition. With no outside backing now, I had to raise the initial development money myself. I formed a company, Bark Hill, and by the end of 1988 had acquired the main blocks of land necessary for the project's success using finance I had raised myself. Of course, I had to take on loads of various professional advisors, with the result that soon it was an open secret what I was planning. Lala was soon on my tail again. If you want to develop Quarryvale, yet you'll have to deal with Owen O'Callaghan. The court property developer? What do I need him for? He's a big man, an important man around these parts, and he has an option on the site at Neilstown, which isn't too far from your quarry veil. And it's also got official zoning as the preferred site by the council. I looked at that place myself. Nobody in their right mind would build on that site. That doesn't matter, because Mr. O'Callaghan, all he has to do is to threaten to build it, and you will be stuck there, quarry veil, forever. If he proceeds, he will get the planning permission, not you. Jesus. Lola. You know how to make a body feel welcome. Look, Owen wants to come on board the Quarryvale thing. He'd be a big asset. He knows his way around here. He's a well-respected <coughs> developer. He could make things happen for you. Yeah, <coughs> man, is he? To his core. 
He has a big pull with the likes of Charlie. Uh, yes, he has. How come he knows about this? Good news travels fast, and Dublin is a small town. I'm just beginning to realise how small. If I farted here, you lot would know before I got a whiff myself. That's as may be, but he has you by the short and curlies, and you know it. What does he want? He wants in on the deal. Well, he can tell you that himself. I'll contact him and set up a meeting for you. I have a feeling you're not doing this out of the goodness of your heart. I want 20% share in the development for myself. You might. That site, it costs between three and five million to develop. If it is developed, it comes to be worth, say, 200 million. Are you telling me you have to be paid 40 million? What investor is going to come on board with a deal like that before him? Tom speaks to the audience. I realized I had goofed. I spoke to several council officials, and they confirmed that if O'Callaghan went ahead with his site at Neilstown, it would cause problems for me. Basically, Quarry Vale could not go ahead unless Neilstown was built on. I knew then that I should have gotten control of that site first. I had been up at the site early in 1988, but I didn't think it could ever be built on, so I passed on it. At the same time, the corporation owned it, and later on that year, Albert Gubbe bought it for three million pounds with a clause included in the contract which stated that if anything was built close by, he didn't have to build on it. Callahan had managed to buy it from Gobe in the meantime, knowing that it would provide him with the vital leverage in any negotiation with me over Quarryvale. Scene three. Tom is meeting with Owen O'Callaghan, who places a drawing on the table in front of them. They shake hands. Mr. O'Callaghan. Owen, oh, please. I thought this might interest you, Tom. It's a drawing. It's a drawing of my Neil's town site with a sketch of a shopping centre. It was done by my architect, Ambrose Kelly. Good, don't you think? Shopping centre? Out there in that dump. You'll never build it. I've already got outline planning permission. And I say it again, you will never build it. Can you be certain, though? To build or not to build, that is the question. Well, it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to build the bloody bugger. All right. What do you want? How much would be more appropriate, don't you think? How much, then? 50-50. You want half my company? It's one of the best sites in Europe, and you want me to give you half of it, just like that? I'll take it off your hands, then. What you pay for it, plus a profit, of course. It's not for sale. Seven million, then, for my place. You must be joking. It's worth fuck all to me. Tom, I want us to be partners, friends. This operation of yours is too big for one man and too big for me anyway. I admire your determination, I really do. But I honestly think the two of us together could pull this off much better. Are you a religious man, Tom? I could be better. All those years in England, I suppose. Are you a family man, Tom? I am. Three boys and a girl. And your wife? Her name is Vera. We met in Luton shortly after she arrived from Donegal. What part of the country are you from yourself? A uh, little place called Lislery. Ah, that's in Mayo, isn't it? It's in Sligo, near Grange. We were small farmers. Oh. The small farmers had it hard in the West, didn't they? We survived. My father had many skills. I'm a countryman myself, you know. A small farmer like myself? Well, he had a bit of land, but I didn't do much farming. I got out young and made something of life like you did. And now you're the most powerful developer in the land. Sure. What does that mean? It's only a label. You're only as good as the people you know. Just only a few days ago, I was meeting with Albert Reynolds, the Minister for Industry and Commerce. That's a big title, anyway. And that night, I was at a function with senior executives of the Allied Irish Banks. Was Quarryville discussed? It was mentioned, as a matter of fact. It's my project you had no right discussing. It's a big project, for Christ's sakes, Tom. A big project in a small country. The biggest around for quite some time. People want in on it. They want to be a part of it. I know they bloody do. You want half of it. Lala wants another bit of it. It seems like half of Dublin wants a bit of it. There'll be nothing left for myself by the time you lot have finished. I suppose Reynolds wants something too. He's a powerful man. He can smooth the path for you. <laughs> for us. There is no us. There will be eventually. There has to be. Otherwise... 
Look, Tom, you and me, we're, we're not politicians. We're just businessmen trying to make an honest living the best way we can. And we have to deal with politicians and officials, whether we like it or not. <laughs> People like Liam Lawler. Yes. Yeah, he can cut through a lot of the bullshit. He's a bloody gangster. He's a survivor at all. And he's got his finger on a lot of pulses in this town. You have got to keep him on side. Does Lawler work for you? <laughs> well, not officially. <laughs> Liam Lawler loves the smell of money. That's why I use him. Any man with that much graph for the green stuff must be reliable. Reliable? Oh, yeah. Especially when his remuneration depends on results. I hear tell you met with Charlie. Laura, I suppose. Yeah, I met him. And it was short and sweet. <coughs> we then chatted about a project for a while, and he gave me an assurance that no ob ob obstacles would be placed in my way at a time when jobs were desperately needed. I hope Liam is looking for you, he said, as I left. I think he was impressed. Impressed enough to demand five million of me. I think that might have been a joke. Some joke. Tom speaks to the audience. <coughs> oh, Callahan was right, of course. I needed him. Well, I needed his sight at Neilstown. I had no choice but to deal with him, and the price was high. I had to pay three and a half million pounds for the Neilstown land to be delivered in stages. <coughs> 800,000 pounds up front, 1.35 million in January 1990, and a final installment of 1.35 million when zoning for Quarryvale was approved. I would be down nearly six million pounds by now if I had acceded to all the demands for money from various quarters. I had told a number of people including O'Callaghan and some politicians, of the constant demands made for me for money. But the five million was the last straw, and I decided to make my complaint more widely known to the authorities. Scene four, a meeting between Redmond, Lawler, and Patrick Flynn, then a minister <coughs> in the Hockey government. <coughs> so, what you're saying, Patrick, is that Gil Martin has already bought the Neilstown site from Owen. Yes, he has. And that puts him in a strong position to develop Quarry's Quarry Vale. If he gets his zoning. He's likely to, isn't he? A lot of the council are behind his plans. We'll see about that. I hear he already has an agreement to purchase 68 acres from the city council and another 12 acres from the county council. I'd say he has all the lands he needs to go ahead now. At 40,000 an acre, I believe. That fella is spreading money around like it was confetti at a wedding. He hasn't got that land yet. What are you up to, George? Oh, I had a word in John Cochran's ear. Who? Ah, you know them now, Patrick. Green Properties. They're developing that retail store at Blanchard's Town. Oh, yes. Him. Look, I'll be honest. I'm retiring in a few months. Only I'd go mad doing nothing, so I'm going to work for John after I retire. I thought a word in his ear might be useful. If he tenders for the same land, it would put a spike in Gil Martin's plans. It would certainly slow him down. Put a stop to his gallop, what? Might bring him down a peg or two. Thinks he can waltz in here and do what he likes, and without paying his dues. I haven't heard any of this talk. I mean it. As a minister of government, I can't be party to any shenanigans. Ah, for fuck's sake, pig, what shenanigans? Look, Gil Martin is going to make a fortune out of this. A large fortune. Hundreds of millions is the estimate. What about us? The poor Dublin fools he has running about like blue-ass flies after him. Fixing up meetings, making introductions, smoothing the path for him. I'm owed consultancy fee. So is George. And you will too, because you'll be dragged into it. I do hear he's already having problems with his advisors getting access to my engineers in the relevant department. Now, look, George, I don't want to know what you're getting up to in the planning department. But whatever it is, don't make it too blatant. I don't want any comebacks. Nothing to reflect badly on the government. We need jobs badly in this city. Anything that looks or smells iffy, and we could be the ones looking for jobs ourselves. And I've had Charlie's brother bend in my ear too. Sean? What's his problem? Gil Martin's been on at him as well. Ah, the man's paranoid. Thinks he's found an honest man in Sean. Not like his brother, then. <laughs> I, I wouldn't let Charlie hear you say that if I was Julian. Not even in jest. I know. 
Still, there doesn't seem to be any lost love between himself and Sean. What gives? Well, and I'm sure you know this anyway, Pete. It seems the boss has been in dispute with Gil Martin's sister about a bit of a bog he was trying to buy in Liz Dairy. Bog? Well, a few acres of scrub adjacent to his holiday home there. <coughs> I think he was hoping to put up a few more buildings on it. Anyway, she laid prior claim to the land, and he had to abandon his plans. I'd say he's trying to give Gil Martin a few sly digs to get his own back. And Gil Martin doesn't know? I doubt it. You don't want to get on the wrong side of Charlie. Something you should all bear in mind. There's another little matter you should know about. Gil Martin has made a complaint to the gardener about planning irregularities. Planning irregularities, my arse. He's the problem. Hear me out, George. Following a meeting between the Taoiseach, Jerry Collins and myself, there's going to be an inquiry into the matter. An inquiry? Oh, Jesus, that's great matters. Uh, I expect it'll run its course and then blow over. You know how these things go. Who's heading the inquiry? Your old friend Hugh Sreeland, I believe. The chief super himself, a good man, one of our own. Gil Martin alleges that you two have asked for cash payments that someone asked him for five million following the meeting at Minster House. Five million? That's a bit strong even for Charlie. He won't get anywhere making accusations like that. I expect they will want to talk to both of you. Enter Tom, who speaks directly to the audience. Chief Superintendent Sreenan made the right pains of the inquiry so far as I was concerned. He interviewed me three times at my Luton home during March of that year, while Sean Hockey and a few others were also spoken to, and another investigating Garda interviewed Owen O'Callaghan in Cork. Liam Lawler was never interviewed at all. And they also failed to question Redmond, very carelesser than I thought. When I got a copy of the final report of my interview with Sreenan, there was no mention at all of the demand for five million. How could that not be included? And when I spoke to him about it, he seemed confused to the point of stupidity. And as for law, there was no evidence to link him to the demand. When I pointed out that the demand came from a woman I could not identify, he admitted that his notes on the conversation were bitty and disjointed. It was not his lack of thoroughness, however, that made me lose complete faith in the inquiry. <laughs> a few days after my conversation with Sreenan, I received a phone call at my home from a woman who introduced herself as Vanguard of Burns. Listen, Gil Martin, the complaints you are making are not welcome here. We've had these complaints before, and all the allegations resulted in those wrongly accused emerging with their reputations unscathed. So why don't you fuck off back to England and stay there? I spoke to O'Callaghan and told him what had happened. He told me I was shooting myself in the foot by making the complaints in the first place. This is not the way business is done in Ireland, he said. I can see that, I replied. The final report said there was no evidence to suggest that Redmond, now retired, had committed any crime. It also said that no evidence of criminal conduct by Liam Lawler had emerged. But back to Patrick Flynn now. I'd been keeping in regular contact with him during my negotiations for Quarry Vale. I supposed, I believed, that he could hurry it up or slow it down, depending on which way the political wind was blowing. It was my complaints to him that had led to the Garda inquiry. Patrick Flynn enters. Well, Patrick, <laughs> what's going to happen now? Once you made it a Garda matter, it was out of my hands, you know that. We politicians can't be seen to interfere with the due process. The inquiry arrived at its conclusions, and we have to accept their decisions. Perhaps they are part of the problem and not the solution. I never saw such a bunch of beggars in all my born days. The hand out wherever I go. Look, Tom, I'll be honest with you. The party is in deep trouble financially. I think we're almost three million in the red. There are lots of activities going on, not always pretty to do something to rectify the matters. Is that what this is all about? To top up Vienna Foyle's coffers? <clears throat> well, a substantial donation to the party might help to curb these activities. And who gets the money? Who's the party treasurer? Well, I am. Uh, <laughs> along with Bertie Hearn. Everyone's looking for money. Deja vu. 
Look, all I'm saying is that it might smooth out some of the problems you seem to be having if uh, they knew you were on site. You mean on the Fianna Foyle site? Well, they wouldn't go out of their way to help you if they thought you might be giving a helping hand to other parties. Oh, Jesus. I'm not on anyone's site. All I want is to build this fucking development without getting all tangled up in the politics. Although, how paying somebody 50,000 in backhanders as politics is beyond me. Ah, that's the system. Some system. How much of a donation are we talking about here? 20,000? 50,000? That sounds like a satisfactory amount. I met somebody last week. He said to me, they'll take your fucking money and still do nothing for you. <laughs> I bet he wasn't a feed of oil, man. Who do I make that check out to? <laughs> Flynn is now packing files, etc., in his, into his briefcase, <coughs> checking his watch, etc., seemingly in a big hurry. Oh, uh, look, there's, there's a car waiting for me. I've got an important meeting shortly. Uh, just, uh, just leave the check on the desk. I'll sort it out later. He exits. Tom speaks to the audience. And that was the last I saw of my 50 grand. Why did I get the money? All I wanted was to give some chance of the scheme of getting off the ground. And it had now been suggested by the government official that I had to pay to get justice, so I felt I had no option but to pay up. Besides, it was going into Fianna Foyle's coffers and there was an election coming, so they probably needed it. <coughs> Scene five, Tom speaks to the audience. I heard good words about Bertie Ahern. A man of the people, they said. So I contacted him. I raised the issue of how long it was taking to get Quarry Bay land sorted out, and he said he would see what he could do. A couple of weeks later, I was contacted by the council to tell me that my tender had been approved. At last, a man of his word. Bertie Ahern answers. I want to thank you for your help, Mr. Ahern. Bertie, please, everyone calls me Bertie. Oh, thanks anyway. Bertie, if there's anything I could do... Oh, don't worry about it, Tom. It's not many Irishmen, successful ones, I might add, who are prepared to come back and invest their hard-earned money in the old country. Give me the place a leg up when times are tough. What made you do it? Poverty. A couple of years ago, I noticed a big influx of young Irish people on the streets of Luton. Most of them were just arrived, looking for work. I got talking to one young lad who was looking in the windows of a McDonald's and then checking how much money he had in his pocket. I asked him if he was long in Luton and he said a few weeks. He couldn't get work, he had no luck at all. I said, why the hell don't you go home? Anything's better than the streets of Luton. I asked him if he had any money and he said he didn't have the fair home. Anyway, if I go home, there's no hope at all. I'd rather starve. Here was a young fellow walking the streets of Luton, looking for a job with hardly the price of a burger, but he considered going home the greater of two evils. I told him I could understand, because I came over in the 1950s when there was no hope either. But I felt that it was a damning indictment of Ireland. I gave him some money, and an address of a building site in Milton Keynes where, if he mentioned my name, he should get fixed up. It was then that I decided to see if I could do anything to help rescue the Irish economy and keep lads like him at home. And here you are. And here I am. And very welcome you are. To be honest, this country is on its knees economically. People like yourself are to be encouraged and helped as much as possible. Anything that brings Jobs is good news. And with an election coming up shortly, we need all the good news we can get. Will you win it? Oh, I hope so. For your sake as well as ours. Look, maybe there is something you could do. The party is in a bit of a state, financially. <laughs> you could consider making a donation to it. I have already given Patrick Flynn 50,000 pounds towards the party's funds. Well, he hasn't got round to telling me yet that he's his own so. Mind you, I suppose it's understandable. Uh, we're all running around with our tails between our legs with all the election rallies and so on. I'm sorry, Tom, if I embarrassed you. I should have known the state of play. Bertie exits as Tom speaks to the audience. Fiona Foyle did win the election. 
with the help of the progressive Democrats, and the faces in the government remained much the same. I had my own problems to deal with by now. I spent almost four and a half million of my own money, and it was getting near the time when I had to pay the second installment to Owen O'Callaghan. And to Owen O'Callaghan. I hear tell the Bank of Ireland has turned you down. Bad news travels fast in this town. That's no big deal. I happen to use the same bank for a lot of my business loans, for example. How much were you looking for? It's not a problem. I can get the money somewhere else. But since you ask, nine million would do it. A short-term facility while I complete the land purchases and other residentals. Including my payment, I hope. Of course. You should try AIP. I think you'd find them more accommodating. Eddie Kay's your man. Tell him I sent you. Thanks. I might try it if all else fails. I hope you don't want an introduction fee. Everybody wants an introduction fee in this town. But no, I don't want anything. I want to see this project get off the ground just as much as you do. Don't forget, I have an investment in it. But not of an interest to, in to invest your own money in it. Yet you were prepared to buy another site to direct competition and force me to buy it off you with a handsome profit to yourself. <laughs> that was only business, Tom. Nothing personal, I can assure you. Yeah, right, nothing personal. I must remember that. You know, I found only one honest politician in Dublin since I've been here. What then is that? Who was it? Bertie Ahern. <laughs> Jason, that's the best one yet. Bertie Ahern! Sure, his right ball doesn't know where the left one does be half the time. I found him very helpful in getting the sale of Quarry Bill land pushed through. Well, of course it was. After I paid him £50,000 to do so. What? You heard? I paid Bertie Ahern £50,000 to push that deal through after he came to me. Why would you do that? Because he told me that if I didn't, green property, your underbidders would get the land and not you. Which was in nobody's interest, neither yours nor mine. You would have to go back to them to buy it, and the price would have been a hundred thousand an acre, not seventy. That's all a fucking game, Tom. These shower bastards are only interested in screwing as much money as they can out of the developers. And you have to play the game, or else you get nowhere. I know. I've been playing the game all my life. So Bertie Ahern is on your payroll. Yes, and plenty more I could mention. <laughs> money talks in this town, Tom. You should have learned that by now. Tom speaks to the audience. I did get the loan from AIB in the end. 8.5 million. However, they made it clear they wanted O'Callaghan brought in on the project and the only way I could get the loan was to agree to this. Eventually, I signed an agreement giving him a 25% stake in the company and control of the daily decisions in relation to the project for which O'Callaghan said he could deliver on-site rezoning, planning and designation. It was now late 1990. <clears throat> After two years of vicious dogfighting, this was all I had to show for it. Owen had got what he wanted, a substantial stake in my company, without investing a penny of his own money. I didn't know it then, but that was only the beginning of my troubles. Scene six. Liam Lawler, Owen O'Callaghan, Patrick Flynn, in conversation. This rezoning application is going to be discussed at a council meeting in a few days. Will it go through? Yeah, I reckon it will. There's plenty of support for it. And so there should be. There's going to be a lot of jobs coming with it. And plenty of them jobs for the boys, eh? The only problem is this. My advisors have estimated that the site would have a value of 20 million when resolved. This would make it possible for Gil Martin to get a loan anywhere to cover his debts, pay me and the bank back off, and be back in the driving seat again. And none of the rest of us getting a penny out of the fucking thing. This is my pension plan we're talking about here. You haven't done so badly out of it so far, Liam. Out of me. I worked for that fucking money. You wanted things done. Decisions made in your favour. I made sure they were. Kid, I'm not complaining. Just saying it's the way things are, that's all. I never got a penny for that tight bastard Gil Martin, for all my efforts. You didn't do so bad then, Pete. You managed to squeeze 50k out of it. <laughs> that was for the party. Did I hear tell they haven't seen any of it yet? Tell Bertie the check's in the post. <laughs> uh, Bertie is a cash only man. I don't even think he has a bank account. Not in this country anyway. 
He's been pleading in poverty ever since the wife left him. Did I hear she's very high maintenance? <laughs> she won't get much out of Bertie. He's a cute horn, all right. <laughs> I've been thinking, maybe I should ask the bank to call in Gil Martin's loan. And how, how would that help? Well, it's the best part of nine million, and I know he hasn't got the money, and won't have until the site is rezoned. What if the bank threatens to call in the loan unless he drafts a re unless he signs a redrafted agreement giving me the major share in the company? Then, when we get the rezoning, I'll be in control and not him. Mm. Will the bank agree? Of course they will. It's good to have friends in high places, AP. Eh, I don't see how I could help. There is no need to worry yourself about it. They have already suggested something along those lines themselves. They want me in control of the project. Have done from the beginning. Better the devil you know. They don't trust Gil Martin with their money. In fact, the plan is already in motion. He picks up a phone and dials. We can see the four men during this exchange, Lawler, Flynn and O'Callaghan in a group at one end of the stage, Tom at the other end. Tom answers the phone. Hello? It's Owen. I suppose you've had the bad news. The AIB threatening to call in the fucking loan. Yes. What are they playing at? Listen to this. He reads from a document. Unless we reach an acceptable agreement that would facilitate this rezoning process, which is critical for the development of the plan for the shopping centre at Quarryvale, we will require you to discharge your obligations to the bank and Mr O'Callaghan immediately. I thought we had an agreement. They're panicking a little bit, what with the vote coming up shortly. I thought you had all that taken care of. You're the man with the contact, you told me. I don't see any problem in that department. But you know what banks can be like. It's fucking blackmail, that's what it is. It's three days before the vote. Where do they think I'm going to get five million in that time? I'm sure you can come up with some kind of agreement that suits them. Yeah, if I sign this redrafted heads of agreement. Have you seen it? <laughs> but of course you have. That shower will piss without an eye from you. You'll have 44%. 44% of my company. No, it won't be my company anymore, will it? You'll be the major shareholder in the driving seat. Oh, I can't say that it matters who's driving. It's what you wanted from day one. You will still make a lot of money out of it, Tom. Fuck you, O'Callaghan. He slams down the fur. The others dance a jig of delight. Tom speaks to the audience. Of course, I had no choice but to sign this new agreement. I was out of money and out of options. As soon as the zoning was approved, they brought in a public relations expert, Frank Dunlop, and they gave him a slush fund, all without my knowledge, of thousands of pounds to smooth the way of the development. Many palms were greased in the process. O'Callaghan had the Dublin councillors and many of the politicians eating out of his hand. He had what he wanted, control of the project. Well, maybe not all that he wanted. He wanted me out of the picture completely, and the way things were turning out, I was beginning to rue the day I'd ever come to Dublin in the first place. But it wasn't finished yet, not by a long shot. It was only the beginning. Scene seven, Tom and Owen O'Callaghan are talking. Have you seen this? Yeah, and I saw a copy earlier. The people, that Sunday rag. They say you owe the inland revenue seven million pounds in tax, is that true? No, of course it's not true. Someone's trying to ruin me. So where did they get the story from? Well, it's true that they're looking for that sum off me, but it doesn't mean I owe it. We had agreed a sum of 120,000 a little while ago for a property deal I had completed in Milton Keynes, and that was as far as I was concerned. I expect some bastard there sold me for 30 pieces of silver. Maybe that's your trouble. You're too trusting. You let people take advantage of you. I take people at face value. They say you could be made bankrupt. Yes, I could be. And I will be if I can't sort it out. Owen exits as Tom speaks to the audience. Poverty is nothing new to me. Now I was experiencing it again courtesy of a plot hatched up in Dublin, which had the English tax authorities demanding seven million in back taxes that I didn't owe. I tried to argue, 
but I was forced into bankruptcy. Everything I owned was seized, including my car. We were left literally penniless. My wife Vera, who had been battling multiple sclerosis for a number of years, but until then, a mobile and hardworking wife and mother was placed under extraordinary stress as she tried to look after the home without even being able to draw social welfare benefits. Occasionally, despite all her efforts, there was nothing in the fridge. My son, Thomas, still at school, gave what he had saved up over the years, including his Holy Communion money, to help us. The ordeal triggered a marked decline in Vera's health, her illness gradually overcoming her. It took me three years to emerge from the bankruptcy process. The English revenue boys eventually realized their mistake and told me that they had been misled with information from Dublin. I didn't owe them anything but the £120,000, a sum we had previously agreed upon. But it destroyed any chance of keeping control of my business in Dublin. I could not even afford the price of airfares to attend board meetings at Barkill in Dublin. It went ahead without me, of course, with Owen in sole charge, and all sorts of deals and decisions were made, decisions which I knew nothing about. By now, Bertie Ahern was the man in charge of the country to talk about past the baton. The few short years I'd been in Dublin, had seen hockey come and go, the resignation, of course, for some skullduggery or other. Albert Reynolds had gone the same way, Bertie stepping in for a short time as Taoiseach before an election was called. Fianna Gael won that election, leaving Fianna Foyle in the political wilderness for a few years, but now they were back in power again, and Bertie was in the driving seat. Act 2. Scene 8. AIB Bank premises, Dublin. Tom is on the phone when O'Callaghan enters. Jesus, what's the matter with you? Not spying on me, are you? A bit of a hangover from last night, where I had to smile at the likes of Ray Burke, Flynn and the rest of that shower. I thought they were all your buddies. It's only as long as there's something in it for them. I'm beginning to realise there's not an honest politician in the whole of Dublin. It took you a long time to work that out. They came over here with the best of intentions. I was going to provide work for hundreds of people. I thought, not pensions for that gang in the Doyle. Boots for the footless. What? It's an expression they have here in Dublin. Boots for the footless. It means you were wasting your time. Once they smelled the money, the big money involved, the vultures were always going to swoop down on you. That's what I was trying to tell you all along. Only you wouldn't listen. If you had, you wouldn't be in the place you are now. You mean broke? Well, at least you got your good name back. Her Majesty's tax man cleared you, I hear. No thanks to the likes of yourself. I had nothing to do with what went on. Somebody did. Somebody here in Dublin put the boot in. Someone in this bank, I'm pretty sure. Why? I was only trying to do some good for the country. Don't tell me you were in it out of the goodness of your heart. You planned to make millions out of it just as much as I did. At least I put my own money where my mouth was. Five millions of it. What the fuck have you put into it? You'd be surprised when you add everything up. Jesus. I thought this uh, sort of behaviour only went on in places like Venezuela or Timber. Well, there's money, there's muck, Tom. Anyway, I'm sick of the whole lot of it. I told the bank as much. I'm considering an offer from British Television Company to cooperate with their investigation to planning corruption in Ireland. You told the bank this? Too right I did. I took great pleasure in telling them the good news. No wonder they're worried. They wouldn't want anything to jeopardise their negotiations with Grosvenor Holdings. It would have been nice to have been informed. Yeah, but surely you knew. How would I know? Did anybody bother telling me? Did you? You were the one that approached them in the first place. Yes, I did. And Marks and Spencers, John Lewis, Topshop, Debenhams, and more. And they're all at the table now. Yes, they are. Don't think we aren't thankful, Tom. Oh, shove your fangs away. You and your cronies tried to ruin me. You cheated me out of my company. Once. I thought you were like me. Now, all I want is to get my money back and never see any of your faces again. My Vera is in a wheelchair, do you know that? She needs full-time care now for the rest of her life. The bankruptcy business is just too much for her to cope with. I'm sorry your wife is unwell. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. 
You really mean that you would sell your stake in the company? Yes, I do. Put a package together and I'll look it over. It's what you always wanted, Owen. Go on. You can admit it now. What I always wanted was for us to work together, to be partners. Lies, Owen. All bloody lies. But to be honest, I don't care anymore. Go on, celebrate. You've won. Tom speaks to the audience. And that was the end of my involvement with Barkill, the company I had set up with such high hopes. I eventually walked away with just over eight million, which was only a fraction of what the development would eventually be worth. But I couldn't wait any longer. My family had lived like paupers for the last few years. We needed to get back to normal life as soon as possible. I had been badly treated by the other shareholders, including the bank. My solicitor advised me to take legal proceedings against them. But at that moment, I just wanted to get the hell out of Dublin, rest and recuperate in my own home in Luton. And I told him I would give it consideration. Scene 9. Preliminary discussions with Tom in Luton about attending the Marne Tribunal, established in October 1997, to inquire into certain planning matters and payments. Tom is talking with Mary Ann Howard, the Tribunal Solicitor. Tom speaks to the audience. And so, we come to the Tribunal, set up in 1997, to look into certain matters and payments. Bribery, in other words. Ironically, it was Bertie Ahern who was instrumental in setting it up. Mr. Gilmart, pleased to meet you. We were hoping you would come to Dublin to talk to us. I don't ever want to see the sky about Dublin again, to be honest. I lost my money, my good name, <coughs> my wife's health because of my association with that damn place. And that's something I hope we can put right. Not your wife's health, of course, for, for which you have my heartfelt sorrow. But your treatment in our capital. This is the tribunal's terms of reference. She hands him a document which Tom reads. He laughs. <laughs> What's so funny? I heard a lot of Irish jokes over the past 40 years in England. Some of them were corny, some were offensive, some of them were funny. But this is the funniest of them all. This takes the biscuits. It's no joke, Mr. Gilmartin. I am deadly serious. I wanted to assure you of both my own and the tribunal's determination to get to the truth of the allegations we have received. Oh, pardon me for doubting you, but I see your tribunal is chaired by a judge probably appointed by Charles Hockey. Now you hand me a letter saying that you are hired by the same people who caused me all these problems in the first place and that you are to report back to them. It's the funniest thing ever, although I did once think Bertie Ahern was an honest man, which is almost as funny. There's nothing funny about a judicial inquiry, I can assure you. It was initially set up by Mr Ahern, which in his capacity as government minister, and is wide-ranging uh, wide in its remit. A man who now himself being investigated. A little ironic, to say the least. You must give us a chance. I am, as you know, the tribunal's solicitor, and my job essentially is to gather every bit of information you have regarding the problems you came up against. Problems? <laughs> I would describe them as a bit more than problems. Requests, demands, threats, all sorts of skullduggery to get me to part with my money. Could be a long interview, and some of it goes back a long time, maybe six years my memory might not always be accurate. Nevertheless, I want you to tell me everything. First hand, second hand, hearsay, phone calls, and stories of other corrupt practices you heard about. Take your time. To begin, why did you fail to cooperate with the Guardian investigation into your complaints back in uh, 1990? It was clearly nothing but a whitewash. And because I received a phone call from a woman describing herself as a senior guarder who told me to drop my complaint and fuck off back to England. Did you report this at the time? Take legal action? No. Why not? It would be like going to law with the devil himself and the courts in hell. It's a pity you didn't. We might be able to corroborate what happened if you had. Well, Chief, Superintend Chief Superintendent Sreenan made a right bold 
a mess of the inquiry, as far as I was concerned. He interviewed me three times at my Luton home, and whilst Sean Hockey and a few others were also spoken to, and another investigating guard spoke to Owen O'Callaghan in Cork, Liam Lawler was never mentioned at all. Nor Edmund, very careless of them, I thought. And what were the final conclusions of his inquiry? That there was no evidence to suggest that Redmond, now retired, had committed any crime. It also found that no evidence of any criminal conduct by Liam Lawler had emerged. I agree that it sounds unsatisfactory. Nevertheless, we are still hoping you will agree to come to Dublin for the hearings. How long is this inquiry to last? Who knows? It depends on what we dig up and who we call. Bertie Ahern? Patrick Flynn? Liam Lawler? Nobody will be excused if we think they have information we need to hear. So it could take years. Possibly. Mr. Ahern is the tea shop. Nevertheless, he is still subject to the laws of the land, like the rest of us. I said before, I have no wish to see the sky over Dublin again. I certainly don't wish to see it for several years. You would only be required to attend occasionally, whenever issues relevant to your complaints were being looked at. In that case, my solicitors have advised me to seek immunity from prosecution by the Director of Public Prosecutions. I don't believe I need it, as I've done nothing wrong, but they insist. So you will come then, if you have a guarantee of immunity? I don't know. It's my family to consider. I'd have to have a long think about it. Thank you, Mr. Gilmartin. Scene 10. What really made up my mind was Padraig Flynn's appearance on the Late Late Show. When Gay Byrne asked him about the 50k he received from me, he was very evasive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Gay. Uh, no, I haven't seen him for years. He's a Sligo man who went to England and made a lot of money. He came back, wanted to do a lot of business in Ireland. Didn't work out for him. Didn't work out for him. He's not well. His wife's not well. Not well at all. And he's... He's out of sorts. Not well. There was a lot weller than him to talk aloud. <laughs> but it was what he said about my wife, Vera, that really upset us. Particularly Vera, who didn't want her medical condition discussed by every Tom, Dick and Harry on the Late Late Show. She wasn't very happy, I can tell you. I made up my mind then and there to give evidence to the tribunal. Scene 11, Dublin Castle, the Marne Tribunal. Liam Lawler is defending himself. We are all out of step except Tom Gilmartin. He left the west of Ireland in his proverbial bare feet and trousers in a bad condition. He came back to save the country by driving a coach and four through the 1974 development plan. We were expected to disregard the plan to facilitate his greed. It's a bit rich you talking about greed, Mr. Lawler. And as for barefoot Irish and Luton, most of them are doing pretty well. It's an insult and a put-down of decent people who did more for this country than you and your ilk. And they never asked what was in it for them. I know all about the system and how it worked. What system? You've lost me there. The system whereby a nexus of councillors, Fianna Foyle and Fianna Gael and some independents, offered their support in terms of signing motions for consideration during the course of the development plan and in terms of support via votes in the chamber, in return for cash, of course. It's all a figment of your imagination. Either that, or you're just slinging mud in the direction of hard-working councillors, hoping that some of it will stick to them. You've already been to jail twice, and find thousands for contempt of court in refusing to disclose your financial affairs to this tribunal. So I will take no lectures from you on the matter of motives or anything else. Mary Ann Howard, the tribunal solicitor, speaks. Mr. Gilmar, could you explain what your original plans were regarding this uh, development at Quarryvale? I had no intention of building anything in Dublin. My intention was to acquire sites, then bring in investors to develop my vision for a major retail complex that would transform the north inner city. So you're no philanthropist then? Not another Bill Gates? No. 
I never pretended to be a philanthropist or anything else, just an honest man seeing <coughs> what I thought would be a good investment and the chance to provide some work for my struggling countrymen. When did you first meet Bertie Ahern? I first met him at the Department of Labour in October 1987. Mr. Ahern says he has no recollection of that meeting. Uh, to be fair, Mr. Ahern has since recalled meeting me on three separate occasions. And Mr. Lawler? What role did he have as regards the Quarry Vale project? Mr. Lawler was a member of Parliament, and I was not 100% enlightened as to what the circumstances were or how businesses operated in Dublin. He had no input into the scheme itself. He had no input into the acquisition of properties itself. He had no input into any negotiations going on. The only possible thing that he might have was some political clout. I facilitated a lot of meetings, brought people together, made things happen. For which you are well overpaid. Were the payments to him political contributions? Certainly not. He was employed by Arlington as a consultant and he was paid a consultancy fee by Arlington. I said there are no bribes involved. No bribes were paid to me by me but plenty were requested and paid by others. Any monies requested, I was entitled to. Consultancy fees, expenses. Was I expected to work for nothing? 100,000 here, 50,000 there, 30,000 for this, 20,000 for this. You wouldn't get out of bed for less than 20,000. You want something done, you pay for it. That's the way it works. You are a paid member of parliament. These were extracurricular activities, entirely separate from my parliamentary duties. And there was me thinking that being a TD was a full-time occupation. You are a discredited witness, Mr. Lawler. You are now trying to muddy the waters in this investigation. Do you know how many bank accounts you have had over the past 20 years? Uh, offhand, no. 110. <laughs> 110 bank accounts in various countries from Liechtenstein to the United States. What in the gay name of God were they all for? I like to spread my money around. <laughs> <laughs> You're either a fool or a knave. How many times have you been jailed by the Supreme Court for contempt of court to date? Three times. Are you expecting a fourth? We'll see who blinks first. A man's financial matters are his own business and nobody else's. Thank you, Mr. Lawler. You may step down. Now, Mr. Gilmartin, tell us about the demand for five million pounds. It came just after my meeting with Mr. Hockey and his ministers in Leinster House. In the country's parliament? Yes. Who was present? Albert Reynolds, Bertie Ahern, Jerry Collins, Brian Lenehan, Patrick Flynn, Liam Lawler. Almost a full house, in fact. You spoke with Mr. Hoy? Yes. He asked me where I was from. I said Sligo, and he said, you're one of them Gilmartins from Liz Larry. I said I was. Then he asked me if Liam was looking for me, which I took to mean Liam Lawler. Did anybody else contribute to the discussion? Not really. They just greeted me when I came in. Shortly afterwards, I was in the corridor when this woman approached, uh, approached me and gave me a piece of paper. It had details of a Bank of Ireland account on the, Isle of, on the Isle of Man on it. The woman told me to deposit five million in the account. You should be writing novels, Gilmartin. You didn't pay the demand. Five million? Are you joking me? I felt it despicable that you come into a country that's on its knees and that queues down the American embassy and elsewhere with the kids leaving and walking the streets of London. Absolutely despicable that people who run this country have no interest whatsoever in those people other than feathering their own nests. You had a meeting with Patrick Flynn a few days later. Did you mention this to him? No because I didn't know what it was all about. I didn't know who was involved. It was after coming out of a meeting of ministers or having been introduced to the tea shock, and I wasn't quite sure what the overall game was. I did complain to him later when I realized the extent of the corruption I was encountering, and it was at this point he suggested a substantial donation to the party might be the answer to my problems. This was when you wrote him the check for 50,000 pounds? Yes. 
made out to him? It wasn't made out to anybody. Why not? Mr. Flynn was in a hurry. He was late for some meeting or other, so he said just leave it on the desk and he would deal with it later. And it was a £50,000 donation to the Vienna Foil Party? Yes. Not a personal donation to Patrick Flynn? Certainly not. And did Vienna Foil ever receive this donation? Not to my knowledge. Have you received threats since your decision to give evidence to this tribunal? Yes, many. The first one said that if I turned up in Dublin to give evidence to remember Veronica Guerin, then I would know what was waiting for me. But in very strong language. The second phone call, my son answered, and he was told in no uncertain terms to tell me if I gave evidence, I would not be coming back. The others were along the same lines. And what was your reaction? I told them all the same thing. You'd better make a good job of me. Conor McGuire, representing Mr. Her. Mr. Gilmartin, there was no meeting at all with Mr. Ahern and the other ministers in Leinster House, was there? This is Mr. Ahern's diary, which shows him handing out certificates in Glasnevin at the time you say he was in the dock. What I am suggesting, Mr. Gilmartin, is as follows. I'm suggesting to you that the evidence is that, in fact, at the time you are talking about and from the description that you have given to the tribunal, that Mr. Ahern was elsewhere at the time. I am not aware. I know he was present at the meeting in the Doyle. He greeted me on first name terms. He had three meetings before that with me, so he wasn't exactly a stranger. His diary says otherwise. Well, it's not entirely Hong Kong, is it? What do you mean by that, Mr. Gilmartin? I'm just saying that Class 11, Leinster House, is not a thousand miles away. You seem to portray yourself as a victim at every stage in relation to this. The Inland Revenue took proceedings against you and bankrupted you. Is that correct? That's correct. On false information, and I can prove it. I didn't get justice there, and I didn't get justice here. I don't say this lightly, Mr. Gilmartin, but you're an embittered man, aren't you? No. I'm not embittered. I was never bitter. I always thought that if the Lord meant me to have something, I'd have it. If not, well, the only bitterness I have in my life is the way my wife has wound up and what was done to her and done to me by Mr. Owen O'Callaghan and his crooked politicians. I want to suggest that your evidence is less than frank. In other words, that you're shifty and that you have given dishonest evidence. It's not the first time you have been called shifty, is it? I was never shifty. If you want to know a little more about me, Mr. Wire, inquire about a lot of people from your own country. There's thousands there will tell you about me, and one thing is sure, they found me reliable. Do you recall your agreement to purchase the land at Newstown owned by my client, Mr. O'Callaghan? I do. Can you confirm? that this is a copy of the agreement? That is a falsified agreement. Huh, I know, that's what you keep on saying. I know, and I will prove it. Just stick to the facts, if you would. Please. I am sticking to the facts. That's not the agreement I signed. Tell me, is it the case that the very first time that you told the tribunal that this is not the agreement you signed is in the course of this hearing? This is not the agreement that was originally drawn up. It's a forgery. Oh, Mr. O'Callaghan is very good at that sort of thing. He's well known as the cuckoo. He's managing to get, take over other people's nests. I suggest you're motivated by the grudgery because he is successful and you are not. All your criticism now has come about because you were given eight million pounds when you sold your interest in Quarryvale, and it's motivated by bitterness because you've seen how successful the Liffey Valley development was without you. Do you know how much it is worth now? Yes, a lot more than I was paid for my share. It's worth somewhere in the region 
of 150 million pounds, I believe. So isn't that the reason for your motivation? No. It was motivated after Mr. Callahan defrauded me and the bank with him to get control of my money. It was motivated by... I was not going to allow my money to prop up a deal because O'Callaghan had no money in it. And as a matter of fact, with the help of the bank, had stolen one million pounds and a half to pay for the crooked politicians that he bought. And they were numerous. Mr. O'Hearn, what is a dig out? In what context are you talking about? I ask the question. Mr. Allen. I'm sure you're familiar with the phrase. It's a phrase you coined yourself. Ah, you mean my dig out? I do, Mr. Allen. It refers to a time when my friends got together and raised a certain amount of money to help me out. They dug me out of a hole, financially, I mean. Thank you, Mr. Allen. How much was the sum involved? I think it was probably around. Thirty thousand pounds. Thirty thousand pounds. You do have very generous friends, don't you? I do. I'm very lucky. Wouldn't you have gone to your bank for a loan? That's what most of us do when we are financially strapped. At the time, I didn't have a bank account. <laughs> you were Minister of State and no bank account? When was this? It was the period after the separation from your wife. The late 80s to the mid-90s. You mean for a period of five or six years, you had no bank account? Yes. But why, Mr. Ahern? It suited me that way. But how did you cash your salary? I presume the government didn't give it to you as a wad of cash in a, a brown envelope. I was paid by, by check. Uh, the secretary cashed it for me. I gave it to me. In, in cash. Uh, in, in her bank? I believe so, yeah. Which you kept when? Usually in a safe in the constituency office. I, I merely drew what I needed for my living expenses. And left the rest to accumulate in the safe? Yes. How much accumulated in this safe over the period? Oh, I think it, I think it was approximately 50,000. 50,000 pounds. And this was during the period of your famous dig out? Yes. So you had 50,000 in your safe, and your friends collected 30,000 for you because you were hard up. So you had, in fact, 80,000 in cash. Well, well, there wouldn't have been 50,000 there at the time I received the 30,000. Nevertheless, you weren't hard up at all, were you? Oh, I was. I had a lot of expenses. With the separation going through and all that. I would have thought that a bank where your money would have earned interest would have been a better solution than a cupboard in your constituency office. And when did you resume normal banking practices? I believe it was late 1993. Do you have any more dig outs after that period? No. What about the 100k you received from people during the period of 1993 to 1994? What I got personally in my life, to be frank with you, is none of your business. <laughs> if I got something from someone as a, a present or someone like that, I can use it. Ah, so it was a present from a friend? Yes. It is a debt of honour which I fully intend to pay back. It was given as a result of financial difficulties and encounters following the, the legal separation. How is a present a debt of honour? It, it, was, it was given as a present, but I felt it was a debt of honour that should be paid back. I see. Look, look, I am not answering what I got for my first Holy Communion money, <laughs> my, my confirmation money, or what I got for my birthday, or what I got for anything else. I am not into all that. I gave all the details of everything to do with me life to the tribunal, but I am not under investigation for any of these things. How many friends gave you presents in total? Oh, I don't know. Maybe 10 or 12. Did they all give you 50k? No. 
The amounts vary. And these are political friends. Some are in politics, uh, but all are close friends who have been very close to me most of my life. They're not political friends, they are personal friends, long-standing friends. And yet you appointed many of those people to public office including as paid members of state boards. I might, I might have appointed some, but I appointed them because they were friends, not because of anything they'd given me. Look, we are talking of the difference of, of, of somebody taking millions and, and hundreds of thousands in exchange for contracts, and what is relatively small contributions from friends who had a clear understanding that I would repay in full. When they gave me this money, I said I would take it as a debt of honour that I would repay it in full, and that I would pay tax on it. I know the tax law. I am an accountant. I'm sure you know your law, Mr. Rucker. And did you pay them back? I haven't paid the money, because they refused to take it. <laughs> we could all do with friends like that. I, I think they will now, because they see the difficulty. But I offered them a number of times to repay it. Look, I got into trouble financially. I, I borrowed some money from friends, like any common man. That's all there is to it. It's a long time since Bertie Ahern was a common man. You've been driven around this country since 1987. You never put your hand in your pocket at a forecourt to fill the car with petrol. You're earning more than 250k per annum. So there is no point in comparing yourself to the man who got into trouble and had a wet round. Mr. Horty's connection started as a whiff round as well. And it was purely an accident that it came out. And now you are telling us that during the period you were Minister for Finance, you had no bank account in this jurisdiction. The answer to that question is no. I had no other accounts whatsoever, either inside or outside the state. I operated for a fairly long period without a bank account and did keep the money in my own possession during that period. I had no other accounts. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Gilmartin, isn't it true that you made up stories about the tea shop receiving £50,000 and £30,000 from Owen O'Callaghan, the so-called Quarryvale payments you are making up new allegations almost daily. No, sir, I am only repeating what Owen O'Callaghan told me. If they were not true, then he is the one making up stories, but the money went somewhere, over a million pounds taken from the company. He was the one who said it was used to make corrupt payments. And you stood by and let it happen with your company. It happened during the period I was bankrupt. <coughs> I hardly had enough money to feed my family, never mind fly over here to keep an eye on matters. I was frozen out. O'Callaghan had free reign to do what he liked. <coughs> he was and is a crook, pure and simple. I object to this calumny. I am suffering increasing levels of despair and frustration at the hands of Tom Gilmartin, who has, since May this year, been engaged in a tormented marathon of lies and bitterness under the dubious protection of tribunal privilege, and, more <coughs> seriously, immunity from prosecution, which was issued to him by the DPP on the 1st of October 1998. I am supposed to have been hiding in broom cupboards at the AIB Bank. I am supposed to have told people <coughs> to tell him to leave Dublin. I am supposed to have handed vast swathes of cash to our Taoiseach and former Taoiseach. It is deeply disturbing that in modern civilized democracy, a form can exist where an individual can peddle such monstrous and clearly obvious lies with impunity and immunity. Mr. Gilmartin, would you say you are difficult and irrational or incoherent <coughs> and paranoid? Excuse me. I only asked because your bank manager described you as such, didn't he? He was making a comment as he saw it, and I would take no offence whatsoever because he couldn't believe that what I was saying could happen. Saying? What were you saying? Well, about all the corruption I found in the government and all and in the people who were running Dublin. He didn't believe it was true? I think he found it difficult to accept, yes. He said you were paranoid? The one word he used, yeah. Did anyone at any time advise you that you should get some sort of medical treatment for this? 
paranoia, incoherence, irrationality. Well, I'm here, aren't I? Did anyone advise you? Do you think I need some treatment now? I'm asking you a question. I spent 10 years. I have spent 10 years on and off in this arena. Now I have been reading all sorts of labels put on me by the dial, numerous other people. Constantly I'm reading about this. And now you know me a bit, just for yourself. Do you think I need medical treatment? I'm not going to answer questions that you put to me, Mr. Gilmartin. The question that was put to you was, were you advised by anyone at this time to get medical treatment? That's the question. If you weren't, just say so. No, I wasn't advised because I never needed medical treatment until I had my... The bypass operation was the first time I ever needed any. But psychologically? Well, psychologically, I never believed that I ever needed any treatment. Did you ever get any psychological or psychiatric treatment in relation to these matters? Why would I do that? Sorry, you're asking me a question. I just want you to answer the question. You can answer it one way or the other, Mr. Gilmartin. But why? Why would I get medical treatment for a condition? Do you understand the question? For a condition that didn't exist. Well then, the answer is no. If you didn't? No, the answer is absolutely no. Because I never needed any such treatment. Thank you, Mr. Gilmartin. Now, Mr. Flynn, your contention was that Tom Gilmartin gave you a cheque for £50,000 as a personal contribution to your election expenses. That is correct. How well did you know Mr. Gilmartin? I mean, was he a, a personal friend? I knew him. And the day he gave you the cheque, how long had you been acquainted with him? I had met him a few times, and we had spoken often on the phone. Hardly a close relationship. And yet, he waltzes into your office and waves a cheque for 50000 under your nose, saying, There you are, Patrick. That's for your election expenses. I'm not sure I would put it quite like that. And what way would you put it? Well, we probably talked about things for a while. So you talked for a while, and then he made out a cheque to you. Is, is that it? I suppose so. It, it was a long time ago. Would this photocopy be a true copy of that cheque? Uh, it looks like that, yeah. There's a problem. The amount, the date, and the signature are Mr. Gilmartin's, but the pay £50,000 to Patrick Flynn is not. It's in different handwriting. Is it your handwriting, Mr. Flynn? Uh, no, it's not. No, um, I don't know whose it is. Look, am I on trial here or what? This sounds like a witch hunt to me. You are not on trial, Mr. Flynn. But you are a witness giving evidence under oath. Just bear that in mind. This cheque has been, has been round the houses, but I guess you know all about that. Let me tell you what we know. It was paid into the personal account of your wife, Dorothy, in an allied Irish bank, Castle. <coughs> the address for this account was number three, Northumberland Road, Chiswick, London. It was a bogus non-resident account set up to avoid deposit interest retention tax, a common practice by thousands of bank depositors in Ireland at the time, I believe. The money later found its way into your daughter's bank account, where it was used to purchase offshore unit trust investments for you and your wife. With the proceeds, you bought a hundred acres of forestry land, which gave you an annual div dividend over 20 years. This scheme was meant for small farmers who grew trees on their land, provided they derived at least a quarter of their income from farming. Are you a small farmer, Mr. Flynn? It's my wife's farm. Oh, my <laughs> apologies. It's in her wife's name. I, I mean, it, it is your wife's farm. Your hands are clean. What about
about your conscience? Tom speaks to the audience. I was partly funding that fucker's lifestyle. It emerged that between 1986 and 1993, Flynn had opened three non-resident accounts, depositing more than £155,000 using London addresses at an address in Brussels after he became a member of the EU Commission. God knows how many more he ripped off. Anyway, the tribunal finally concluded that he had corruptly obtained 50k from me. So despite all his lies, I was vindicated. He hasn't been prosecuted to date and won't be unless the police bring criminal charges, which I can't see happening. They look after their own this shower. All quiet on the Western Front again. Bertie has gone. Resigned. Hoisted by his own petard, as they say. He resigned on May the 7th, 2008. I guess it was inevitable. Well, he was an Olympic-class liar. He lied to the Doyle, to the Tribunal, to the Irish people. You couldn't believe a word that came out of his mouth. His convoluted excuses and his half-explanations for the large amounts of money he had lying around where. All I can say is he must think people are fools. He had no bank account for four or five years, was used as a reason, so he dealt only in cash. Ah. His friends clubbed together and gave him large amounts of money when he was financially strapped. And one friend who gave him money was somebody he didn't even know. And Owen O'Callaghan, who said he owed many, me many thousands of pounds he had paid Bertie Hearn to facilitate planning and zoning, but Bertie hadn't had so much of a glass of water from Owen for years. Liam Lawler has gone too, killed in a car crash somewhere on the road to Moscow. He was still ducking and diving, still refusing to cooperate with the tribunal as to the whereabouts of his bank accounts and his money. Now he's carried his secrets to the grave. As for the others, they're all walking around the country, free as birds. My late father fought the War of Independence, and I remember the sacrifices made by that generation of Irish Republicans. They didn't fight for their country for a shower of shysters like that lad to run it. They shamed Fianna Foyle. They shame and stain the name. What will be done about the corruption? What good is it to me? I got nothing but abuse and a load of lies told about me. My company and my business gone, my family shamed and demeaned. What did I ever do to Ireland to deserve this? But maybe this whole tribunal can ensure that no one else will be the victim of such a conspiracy. If it does, that'll be worth it, worth the time and effort. But I wouldn't bet my house on it. The people who caused the rot are walking away scot-free. It's a great little country, isn't it? There'll be those going around clapping them on the back. Ah, sure, they're characters. No, they aren't. The likes of Liam Lawler, Padraig Flynn, George Redmond, Bertie Ahern, they're all a fucking shower of thieves and swindlers. Not fit to run a bingo session, never mind a government. The end.